has had a 50 year career in music, in women's music. She's somebody that you probably have not heard of. Many of you have not heard of. Um, those of you familiar with women's culture may have heard of her. Those of you just in love with great music also may have heard of her. But she changed my life, and today we're going to talk a little bit about identity and how, um, a little bit about how I form my own identity, and she plays a big role in that. Uh, in the mid-1970s, she put out an album called The Changer and the Chains. That album has spanned the test of time. It's still one of the highest grossing albums in all of women's music culture. And it was the first time going to her concert that I walked into a room to see, I don't know, maybe about 800 other people just like myself. Prior to that, I'd been walking around, and I, and I liken this to the parable of the sower, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the relationship between creating my identity and the parable of the sower, thinking how the seeds never sat well prior to that moment. So I walked into a college at a Queens University in New York and saw about 800 other young women there just waiting to hear this performance and I'd never heard of her before. And I realized I was finally in a company of people um, that were like-minded and my feet were standing in ground that felt uh, suitable. So today I'm going to talk to you about history. Thank <laughs> you. 
Testing, check, testing. You have to turn down the volume on the mic. So I turned the music volume down. Mm -hmm. um, so just well, back. if that's turned down, this is turned down too. Okay. Oh, okay. So, so, so it's all and I'll system. turn the music off. Oh, okay. Go ahead and start talking again. Oh, wait. Hello, check testing. All right, good. All right, we'll go with that. Just try to stay in front of the screen mm -hmm. instead of, uh, because if, if you're in front of the screen, you're not going to wind up in front of the speakers. Okay. And don't try to cup it or turn it down. If, uh, okay. If it starts to feed back, flip the switch. Okay. It's, uh, it's still doing that. Keep going that way. But I can't. I need my presentation with me. We can me. move that. We, we can slide this over. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, good, thank you. All right, you can put your phones away now. Thank you. Well, this is a pretty good exercise. I think I leave it up to each one of you to figure out, uh, you know, true and clear responses. Some might be trying to make a little joke. Okay. Most of these are pretty familiar, so. <laughs> I told my class yesterday that I was going to do something like this, and we took, a, we took a trial run at this. And it was pretty funny when they put up the Subaru, because, you know, I drive one. <laughs> it happens. Mm -hmm. And I can't help it, you know, that I fit a few of the stereotypes, and I don't mind it at the same time. And I had a student in my class that I never heard the word butch before. And I'm surprised by that. I said, oh, look at, you know, it, it's a two-way street, learning a little something. You're going to learn a little something today. But I learned a little something there also, about that some of the terminology that I'm very familiar with is not something that everybody's familiar with. Yes, I, I did play varsity softball. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I appreciate your contributions. I'm going to hold on to this and take a look at it later. Good. Yeah, you're, you're going to um, find that a lot of the uh, language in the vernacular used for gay and, lesbian, gay and lesbians today, very different from a different time, uh, you know, that I'm going to talk to you about today. So I'm going to talk to you about lesbians as a subculture of women's culture, and women's culture being a culture built on the shoulders of women who've contributed to society in a way that's influenced us, or provided or guaranteed access to women in many areas, like music, art, industry, philanthropy, uh, legal, law, heads of state, heads of countries, innovators, healers, First ladies, astronauts, who do you know here? Yeah. Somebody tell me someone you recognize. Say it out loud. Ellen. Mm -hmm. Oprah. Oprah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me take you through a few. 
I would expect that Oprah and Ellen would be very familiar, Princess Diana, Hillary Clinton. Um, there are a few others here. Like, I love putting up the picture of the women astronauts, because right now, something's happening that has never happened before, which is there are eight astronauts training for a Mars mission, and it's equally four men and four women, and that's never happened before. So these are the four women currently training for an astronaut mission. Uh, Lucille Ball ran her first movie production company. Helen Keller. How about the woman in uniform in the center next to Ellen? Who's that? Juliet Gordon Lowe. Is that name familiar? 1912, founder of an organization called the Girl Scouts. Clara Barton, Sandra Day O'Connor, Mother Teresa. So all of these women contributed, they formed their identity by contributing something great to society. But they did it in a particular way. They did it within a patriarchal system. And that was, that was um, by fighting, by crashing through what they say are ceilings, by having standards that they had, by having standards put in front of them that their male counterparts did not have. They stayed within a particular construct and they fought through that system. I think about the parable of the sower and I think about not being able to break free, not being able to move forward and create a different society, put your feet on different land, something that better suited. And, and who I'm going to tell you about today is a group of women who made the same kind of contributions to society or formed their own identities outside of a patriarchal system. So that means they stepped outside and they created their own culture. My argument today is that sometimes it's necessary to step outside of the construct of the origins of your identity in order to build a more suitable foundation in which to thrive. That's a long sentence. That's a fancy way of saying sometimes you recognize early on in life that the environment in which you're being raised, whether it's your home, your neighborhood, your, communi your outer community, is not suitable for the person you sense and feel yourself being and becoming. So you might step out of that and find like-minded people or a like-minded place, an environment. Go where your feet feel good on the ground. But what if that doesn't exist? What if that's not there? You don't find those people and you don't find that place. The women I'm telling you about today built an entire culture from the ground up so they would have the suitable place in which to thrive. So what's a parable, right? It's a, it's a short story. In the parable of the sower, it's about the ground, not the seed. It's, you know, they, they explain it as the seeds fall down on a hard path and nothing takes, takes root. And the seed, not being an actual seed, right? So it's a, a thought, an idea, an ideology, a spiritual belief, a, pra a practice, an identity. It can hit the ground, not take root, and just be, you know, whisked off, eaten by birds, right? The next path is, you know, a rocky path, and so it doesn't, nothing, very few roots take, take um, root. It's very temporary, fleeting, something fit you for the moment, and then was gone. In the next system, it's thorns, and many roots, many ideas, many concepts, many ide ideologies. It's too conflicting, nothing grows well, it's twisted. But in the last area, you have fertile ground. It's the right environment, suitability. So something takes root. It's like, I see the women's culture and the women's community to be like a sunflower. If you take that sunflower and put it into a different environment, a dark room, it's not going to thrive. But some things are just meant to be, right? The design is just the design. 
I was always a lesbian, always. So how hard was that going to be for me? Or how easy was that going to be for me? I didn't grow up in a house where that was easy for me. I had a Hispanic father, Puerto Rican family, culture. Um, you know, it might have been a little easier with my mom, but she often sided with my father. So it just was a, not an easy environment. It wasn't something we talked about on the street or the neighbors. There were no TV shows. Will and Grace didn't exist. We didn't have gay things happening. We didn't have conversations. If that kind of topic ever came up, it was in a negative tone, in a negative way. It's different from my nephew. You know, he's as gay as the day is long, and he's happy to be it. And he went to his prom dressed up in a tuxedo and makeup like he was Adam Lambert, and he brought his boyfriend. And I thought, wow, look at the time. <laughs> you know, but I know I did that. I did that for him. I did that work within this group of women fighting and building a culture from the ground up so that your generation and this generation gets to step out and say, oh yeah, I have class at three, then I'm going to Queer Straight Alliance, and then I'll meet you for dinner at four. It's common conversation. But it wasn't during this time. So when does lesbian identification begin? <laughs> That's a funny picture. It has nothing to do with religion. It's just that when I was six, I always knew that I wanted to hang around the classroom and be around Sister Anne. I don't know why. It's not a sexual thing. I just wanted to be around this particular strong female person. And I always wanted to be there. And at the age of six, that started to show itself as, as a, a behavior for me. And then over time, it repeated itself. It didn't matter. I went to summer camp, I follow the counselor around. I go to school, I find the strong teachers that speak to me, that have a presence, that have something that means something to me. And I start to recognize over time that these attachments and these enlightenments are, are, are available to me. But I'm not in an environment that is fertile for that. I have to keep that secret and hidden. So I was thinking a lot about the stories that have come before today's talk how your identity can be formed or based on like the town you were born in, or historical perspective, personalities. I'm thinking, how long did it take for me to get an identity? Because I had this identity that had to be a secret for so long. It took a long time to be able to, you know, we call it, maybe some people call that coming out. I don't, I don't know if that's actually relative. It's coming out is, oh, I'm coming out, so now I have an identity. I always had that identity but I wasn't able to uh, feed it and nurture it and develop that or even express it to anyone. And believe me, once that becomes available to you, and that might be for anybody here in this room, there's something here for everybody. There's some part of you that you get to express or you get to hide right now. You're still hiding something or you haven't expressed something fully. It's gonna take time, it's gonna take the people that you meet, the environments that you move and switch to before you can fully develop that. And that will always be a you know, work in progress. I think, you know, it wasn't all, I wanted to say that it's also not just about what you figure out, that you're connected to these female attachments. It's also, it is also the environment. It's the other siblings and what they will do and what you won't do. It's what you're expected to do. You're expected to date. You're expected to date boys if you're a girl, and if you're a boy, you know, and, and vice versa. The girls in the house are expected to do particular tasks. It's a gender environment, and boys are supposed to do the other tasks. Maybe girls wash the dishes, and boys take off the garbage. Maybe the girls sign up for ballet class, and the guys get to go out for baseball. That's a common thing in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and even forward. I know when I talk to my class, you know, I, I listen to a lot of what's going on in their homes, in their lives, and, and I see the, the ties and the connections over time. Not everything has changed because they have parents, and those parents are my age. And so they're still connected to the life, you know, I was raised in. So I have a basic upbringing. I'm one of four. 
I love my brothers and sisters. I'm number three. We're pretty well connected. We don't live anywhere near each other now, but it doesn't matter. We see each other pretty regularly. Early on, I showed great interest in music. I'm a guitar player. I'm a drummer. I've played music professionally, traveled around the country. I was a varsity athlete in high school and in college playing ball. And yeah, I had a high school boyfriend. And I love this picture where I'm just looking up at him adoringly. <laughs> it uh, feels so out of sorts in a way, but you know, turns out he was really quite gay himself. So <laughs> that's the way that went. You know, and everybody else saw that coming, not me. I just thought he was beautiful and handsome and had good manners, he dressed well, he smelled good, all of that. We grew up in the disco era, so he was like John Travolta. He had all the moves. I should have known it because he had village people posters on his wall. And uh, we'd have these conversations about things and, and such. But, uh, you know, a year later I went to college and I had my first girlfriend. And uh, he taught me a lot about things. He taught me about dressing and about colognes and scents and things. And, you know, I started to find that to be part of my new identity. Who was I going to be? Because it meant all kinds of things meant something in forming that identity. And then over time, you know, there I'm into a long-term partnership. So it's a basic upbringing. So where, where does some of the fertile ground begin? Well, for me, that was summer camp. Summer camp was an opportunity to um, connect with other people who maybe were like-minded. So not everybody who goes to camp is a lesbian. So if there's about 60 lesbians, 60 women working at a camp, you know, small, 10, 12 lesbians might be on the staff. And you find that like-mindedness. But what was more interesting was meeting women from other countries just around your age, right? So they it come, organizations like Amer uh, Camp America and Beauty Camp give uh, students an opportunity to go and be a camp counselor in another country. That's something you can do, and many people have done it and come here. So I make friends with women from Germany and Denmark and Sweden and Switzerland and Japan. And when you happen to find someone who's a lesbian from another country and you're 18 years old, you know, you're learning um, all the ideas of their identity in their country. So, you know, a young woman from Japan, her name is Rieko, and she was outed as a lesbian and was threatened, you know, by her family in a way that she was considering, um, I don't know, I don't want, I never wanted to say, I didn't want, like this being said out loud before, but she considered self-harm in a way. She wanted self-harm because she brought shame to her family in that way. And yet, I met these women from Denmark, and they were, it was totally fine in Denmark. They were, it was legal for them to be married. And it wasn't even a conversation. So where we are today, I think, in some cases, with being a lesbian, was um, something that was already in existence for Denmark quite some time ago. It was my opportunity to you know, expand my perspective and then continue to shape an identity around that. So I mentioned that I played you know, sports. So what would sports have to do with the identity in terms of growing up as a secret lesbian coming out into a culture? Well, I found that some young women, they didn't wear perfume, they wore colognes. And that meant, were you going to have a masculine presence or were you going to have a feminine presence? You had to figure out who you were. And how did you decide that? Maybe it's what suited you. Maybe you felt like you wanted to wear more masculine clothing because you liked the feeling of being what you, um, somebody posted up there and said tomboy, that was a term that was used at the time, tomboyish, to be sort of more masculine or more butch, a presence like that. And some felt a, a, a desire to be more feminine. So you make a decision. Do you wear a tie with your outfit? Do you wear a dress? The softball team would often have you know, parties where they met other teams and traveled together and they'd come to a dinner. And some would wear dresses and some would wear you know, pants and ties and such. And everywhere I looked around, I was trying to figure out where do I fit in? What's my thing? You know, you know still forming that. So is it to be too butch or not too butch? Because what if you decide your sense is to be this butch persona? It's, uh, it's not, that's not readily and easily acceptable. So I'll introduce you to a book by Leslie Feinberg coming up ahead in the slides. Um, she wrote a book called Stone Butch Blues, and she talks about the entire story of the 1950s where women were you know, imprisoned for being too masculine. The education of learning about the culture of being the women's culture of lesbian women 
started at the universities. The first college I went to was City University New York Lehman. It was a four-year college in the Bronx. And they had this tiny little room in the back. It was like three buildings down somewhere. It was called um, the Lesbians at Lehman. But that was only by conversation. It wasn't, uh, there wasn't a sign on the door. It wasn't anything you could sign up for. You had to get word of mouth, knock on the door Thursdays at 4 o'clock, and you could go in and meet some other like-minded individuals. It was kept a secret. There were no big activities, and the only work that they really did was sometimes we'd go into New York City on the weekend, go into Greenwich Village, a very well-known gay and lesbian area, and do some activism work. My first opportunity to become a lesbian activist, where I could sit at a table and get signatures to try to help pass laws for uh, equality or inclusion. Uh, in New York City. But, you know, today, <laughs> Lehman College doesn't have lesbians at Lehman. They have what most people have, a full-on organization that's Queer Straight Alliance, student resources, a website, SUNY Geneseo, where I finished and completed my bachelor's degree. By the time I got there, again, as soon as I got there, it was a secret little club only word of mouth, meet on Tuesday nights, and we'd get together once a month and take a road trip to the state capitol and try to fight on behalf of laws um, to get in place for the state of New York, for gays and lesbians to be uh, protected in dorms and, and in classrooms and, and not to be harassed. Um, there was a lot of crime against gays and lesbians at the time, so women as a culture were often fighting that, often the, the women who did things called like Take Back the Night and had these marches and such. So these are all the universities I've attended or been a part of, right? So University of Northern Colorado, that's a graduate program. Same thing now, they have the GLBTA. San Bernardino, same thing, they have the Pride Center. UC Riverside has their resource center. And then, of course, here at Sonoma State, we have the Queer Straight Alliance. Show of hands, are you familiar with that? Anybody in this room? So not so many of you, huh? Well, allow me to introduce you to the Queer Straight Alliance here on campus, and they have meetings on Fridays, and it's a pretty sizable group. Uh, I think, where's my mouse? It's not coming up on your screen, is it? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure what happened there. It's like, I probably did that before. You must wonder what I'm doing. But on my screen, when I click on these links, I'm clicking on these live links, and it's going right to... Uh, those organizations. So what did I learn at the university to get started? Just that, you know, like there's lesbians, and they have titles for social activities like hike and dike and bike and dike, and so I'm starting to learn a vernacular and develop an identity. But I learned a little bit about the symbols. Are you familiar with these? Any of these? You've seen them around? Well, you've seen the rainbow flag, I'm pretty sure, right? I'm not going to be silly about that. So the rainbow flag being a gay and lesbian symbol, um, just a multi-array of colors bringing together harmony and peace, and, and so it, it's, uh, that's the design of the rainbow flag. But what about the pink triangle? How familiar are you with that? So the pink triangle is how the Nazis used to identify gays and lesbians. And they'd mark them in the encampments. If you were found to be a gay or lesbian person, they marked you with a pink triangle, and you were put to death, but first you were marked. So the gay and lesbian culture decided over time to adopt that symbol for themselves and take back their own power by adopting the symbol for themselves. So they used that symbol as the gay and lesbian, uh, one of the gay and lesbian uh, symbols. For women in particular, down here, this is the labyrinth. The labyrinth. That's a weapon of uh, ancient time, Amazonian women who used it as a symbol of, of power and war and might. And the lambda, over there in the, the, the Greek letter lambda, that's a symbol for the exchange of energy. Again, also adopted, adopted for uh, you know, gay and lesbian identification. This means two women together, two men together, and this is a symbol of human rights and equality. So by the time I'm turning 18 in New York City, it's legal to go to bars. The drinking age is 18. And so this is where the next level of the identity and the education comes in. We would start walking into bars in New York City, and I'm still at the place in time, in the late 70s, early 80s, where 
they can raid bars for finding gays and lesbians inside, right? They can, the police will come in and raid the bars. People can get hurt, people can get arrested. And it was kind of interesting to me. I mean, almost, I have to admit that it was a little bit exciting because I didn't understand it at exactly at the time. It took me a couple of years to really wrap my head around what that was about. But historically, in gay and lesbian culture, there's something called the Stonewall Riots. So that's in the early 70s. The, there's a bar in New York City in Greenwich Village called the Stonewall. And nightly, weekly, the police would come in and they'd raid these gay and lesbian bars and they would drag gays and lesbians out and they would beat them horrifically in the streets and they would arrest them and throw them into paddy wagons, you would be locked up just for identifying as a gay or a lesbian. The women were really treated badly. They were often forced to do really bad sexual things in, in jail before they were even released. And you know, there's horrific stories historically about this process. But the Stonewall is a bar where one night, when the police came in to raid it, the people said they had enough and all the gays and the lesbians came out and rioted into the streets and fought back and had an uprising up against the police. And that particular night created um, the take back the night that they were looking for, in which case uh, the police were, were not raiding. It wasn't happening anymore and laws were changed in New York City about the protection of gays and lesbians and they weren't able to um, you know, raid the bars anymore. But that's not true, they were still raiding them. I was there, I'd be in a bar, the police would raid and we'd sneak out bathroom windows and we'd sneak out back doors. I was 18 and I was sneaking out of a place because I was not, it wasn't okay to be who I was. I thought I was in the right place. I thought I was on fertile ground. I thought I was in the place where the ideas were the, my ideas and the people were my people, but it still wasn't quite right. It took more in the shaping of my identity. One other thing about the bars is it wasn't always easy to just have a bar. They weren't all on the street. You know, Professor Don Romsberg was here and he had, uh, last week, right? So he and I had a conversation at a writing group not too long, you know, a couple of years ago. And he was writing a paper and I was writing a paper and we looked at the similarity of him growing up gay in San Francisco and me growing up lesbian in New York City and how our stories sort of parallel. And one of the things he, things he was talking about was something called the glass coffin. And it's this bar in San Francisco that didn't have any windows for the longest time. The men could go in, but they could not, nobody could look in and see what they were doing. Being in a bar, chatting, talking, having a drink, getting a date. You couldn't look in and they couldn't look out. And our bars were always like that. My entire young youth of, well, I'll say young youth and then bars, sounds funny. But my entire young adult life of going into bars were often drive to a shopping center, find the tiny little bar in the corner, in the back, past the grocery store that didn't have a name on it and just word them out, just go in and you know that it's the bar and you walk in and it's like, oh, hey, and there's everybody. And that feels good. You're in the right place. But at the time, you're not processing. Wow, look what I had to do. I had to always sneak and go to a secret little place in a shopping center hidden from everybody just to find out about secret little events and have my social life that I wanted to develop. I mean, it's hard enough to get a date. It's hard enough to get a girlfriend or a boyfriend. It's hard enough to make those connections. Imagine if you had to do it by doing those secret little sneaky things to find just a place to connect. As I read the parable of the sower, I'm like, my mind is blown about the, the parallel of all of that. But it wasn't just the bars, it was the bookstores and the cafes. Women built their own bookstores and cafes. Now, sadly enough, I have to say it's too bad because a lot of those bookstores are closed down now, and not for any reason other than the reason that every other tiny little bookstore in America has closed down. It's because a big conglomerate of bookstores have taken over, and you can also order lots of books online. We have something different going on. But the bookstores were precious, and they were sacred, and it was a place for you to gather. You'd go to the bookstore because you wanted to read a book that was by, for, and about women, and that was the difference. Why, it's why I played Chris Williamson for you in the beginning, because she's one of the first women who was making music by, for, and about women. You want to go on a date, you want to have a soundtrack, you go and you play it, and there's a song on the radio, and it's some guy singing to a girl, and you just turn it into something that works for you, but it's not really you. And then you turn on Chris Williamson, and all of a sudden you hear a woman singing a love song to a woman, and you go, 
oh my God, that's amazing. Because it suits. It, it, your identity starts to feel like you're putting the right outfit on. And it's the same thing with the bookstores. You walk in and you see, you know, a spy novel, a murder mystery, a science fiction book. And it's lesbian characters and lesbian authors. And you're going, oh my gosh, this is an entire culture of my people. And we have our own bookstores for that. But it was more than just the books. It was, you know, the cafe built with inside so that you could get together and have coffee and know when events were and, and uh, you know, buy jewelry and, and things that made sense to you. It's the first time you find out that there is jewelry that has insignia for women, maybe the labyrinth, maybe the two double women symbol sign. And you start to learn about singer-songwriters who sing for women and comedians and poets. And I start to realize, wow, we have an entire culture that I would never heard, I would have never heard about had I not walked around in these, the little bookstore, the little bar in the corner, the little college club. It's where you learn about the authors. So what do the authors have to do with identity? Well, look at the one on the left, Radcliffe Hall. She wrote two books that were very noted. One was called The Well of Loneliness, and one was called The Unlit Lamp. And when you walked around with The Well of Loneliness like this in your hand, it was like a code. If you saw me walk in and you saw The Well of Loneliness, you're like, ah. Oh. And then they start to size you up. Are you a lesbian? Are you going to be my friend? Are you going to be my connector? Am I going to find a, a, you know identity with you? It was, every one of these books was a code. I mean, she was, you know, pretty significant. Audre Lorde wrote a book, Zami, the Biomythological Misspelling of My Name, and, and she was speaking about black lesbian culture. Oh, so now there's a whole other identity. It's, it's a culture within, a subculture within a subculture. <coughs> Alice Toklas and Gertrude Stein, Gertrude Stein, one of the greatest writers and authors and poets of our time, and she wrote a million love letters to Alice, and they were together forever and ever and ever. But she died. Not at a reasonably, you know, at a, at, at not at a reasonable age. She died fairly young. And Alice Toklas was left with nothing because Gertrude Stein's family came in and took all of her writings and her print and her art. And they were noted in Paris society, in New York society. And everything was reclaimed and taken away from Alice B. Toklas, even though they shared a home and a life for all these years. And she was left to just grow old and die penniless and broke, which a way that I think Gertrude Stein would have never wanted to see happen. That kind of thing still happens today. That's still part of my identity that I have to reckon with. But that happened, you know, back then. Rita Mae Brown, another author, Ruby Fruit Jungle. That was the book. That's like the Bible. You walk around in the 70s and the 80s, you have that book in your hand, you're letting people know, this is, you know, my identification. The Stone Butch Blues, Leslie Feinberg, tells the stories about the women in the 1950s taken away from the paddy by paddy wagons. Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon, you might have seen them in the newspaper any time in the last couple of years. They were together 59 years, and only they were the first couple to be married when the laws changed in the state of California. And, just, and right after getting married, Phyllis Lyon passed away. 59 years together. So this is how... <coughs> This is the tie to the parable of the sower because the women who were writing those books were never getting published by standard book publishing companies. They were not going to publish lesbian author books. So what did the women do? They built their own publishing companies. You won't publish us, we'll build a publishing company. Every one of these here, that's just a sampling of the women, <laughs> author by women, book publishing companies that exist. Women's Press, Gertrude Press, obviously if at the Gertrude Stein, Every one of these, a book publishing company built by women. The publications came next. The women developed their own magazines. It's not a, it's not a negative connotation to say dyke. You know, when I was in junior high school and somebody was called a dyke, you were kind of like, ah, oh, I thought it was a slam. And by the time I was in college, I was a dyke. And that just became a thing, like, oh, it's a proud thing. The term was, you know, was proud. That woman in the center, kind of tiny right there, there's a little cartoon. That's Alison Bechdel 
We went from having the first magazine in the 1950s and 60s, the latter, which is put out by an organization called the Daughters of Belitis, started by those two women, Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon, to Alison Bechdel doing her comics of Dykes to Watch Out For, of which she just wrote an autobiography and a Tony Award winning play. So the play on Broadway right now called Fun Home that just won all the awards last year for best musical, best play, best directing, that's Alison Bechdel's play. You would never have seen a lesbian winning a Tony Award on Broadway at the time we had these publications. And these publications, like Lesbian Connection, when this first came to my house, it was wrapped in like triple layer brown paper, stapled together, put forward together by lesbians for free, sent to you. And it was a secret. They didn't put any kind of markings on the envelope so that the postmaster wouldn't know that you were a lesbian in your house. So your neighbors couldn't see the mail that you got. How crazy that I had to have that identity. I was like 18, 19, 20 years old. My identity was to sneak around and have secret mail out of my mailbox. Like if it was, you know, something awful, like guns or porn. <laughs> Let me tell you about the festivals, because the festivals were, the, were you know, it's a big deal. And too bad we started late, because I see that I'm going to be a little short of time. I'm going to take a couple extra minutes, because I, I put this together for you. I won't run you past your leaving time, but I'm not going to stop in two minutes. Um, the festivals are kind of like my real big tie to the parable of the sower, because the festivals were a gathering place for women to come together and have like anywhere from a three to five day encampment of music, arts, dance, poetry, writing, anything in culture, anything in activism to come out and do this in, in, together, gathering all around the country. It was word of mouth, it was, you know, over time the advertising changed. But one of the largest in the country is the Michigan Women's Music Festival. And the Michigan Women's Music Festival is, is been around, was around for 40 years, something that you might not have ever heard of, but 40 years in place. And what happened is a couple of people bought a piece of land, and every year, 8,000 women would converge from all over the country and all over the world. But they built it from the ground up. They built an entire city. And it was women who were carpenters and electricians and sound engineers and performers and cooks and doctors and nurses and groundskeepers and architects. They would build a city and, and, and then we have tractors running down the road and there was medical tents and everybody got fed. And they do it year after year after year and then they unbuild it and they take it down. It's an extraordinary thing. They built a culture where there's safety, where there's connectivity, The greatest artists, the greatest drummers, the greatest pianists, the greatest musicians, dancers, writers come together, build a city, and that exists. And there you also find the craftswomen, the women who bring their art specifically for by and about women. Sculptures, paintings, carvings. They have their own companies. They have their own design. The musicians who came at that time 
were the early musicians, the pioneers who put out an album, Lavender Jane Loves Women, when, when no recording label would record these women, when nobody would sign a lesbian to a record label deal, they started their own record label called Olivia Records. And when nobody would distribute their records, they started their own distribution companies called Goldenrod and Lady Slipper. And these record labels and distribution companies brought the music forward so the next generation could come ahead. And those women over there, June Millington, she was the only band signed to a major record label deal that dropped them when they wouldn't wear miniskirts and wouldn't dress down and, and be in that. They went on to develop something called the Institute for the Musical Arts in Massachusetts, where they send young girls to rock camp and teach them to be musicians. I was part of this industry because here in this photo you'll see that I was a touring musician in the women's music community for about seven years and got to be a part of something that somebody came and pioneered ahead of time. The top twins in the top right corner, they have a TV show in Australia. And that woman down there in the bottom right corner, Toshi Reagan, well, she's the daughter of Bernice Johnson Reagan, who is one of the singers in Sweet Honey and the Rock, a wonderful women's cultural um, band and choir. And right now, she has something called The Parable of the Sower, the opera. She just wrote and produced an entire opera based on The Parable of the Sower, and it's being performed in New York City. So these are the musicians you might know because they're a little bit more mainstream. They came along and they got major record label deals because over time being a lesbian didn't really matter. And this is maybe a few more artists that come in your generation now that you'll see on the scene. You might recognize a few of these faces. We built our own organizations like Olivia Records, which then turned into Olivia Travel. We have organizations that are specific to us legal organizations specific to us. We have media now, we're on TV. We have TV shows and we have movies because over time we've built that. These are famous lesbians you might be familiar with. These are famous comedians. You might know Leah Delaria from Orange is the, um, Orange is the New Black. These are famous athletes you might be familiar with. We have resort towns that are specific for women to go and have vacations together in safe places around the country that are very specific and no more word of mouth, secret thing. We kind of know where they are. But we have land communities as well, women who want to just live among other women and they buy land and they sort of develop a community. We have travel companies that cater to women and have vacations and cruise ships and adventures just for women to go and travel and be in the company of others. And we have retirement communities now where women can go and retire in the way that they live most of their lives. So the identity that they built, they built a culture to suit their identity. They built their identity within the culture. Sometimes it's necessary to build the foundation like these women did, like I did. We built our record labels. We built our publishing companies. We started our own companies and organizations so that we'd have a place to thrive and take root. That's my story. Thank you.